morning everyone and uh, happy saraswati puja to every all of the participants who have joined today uh, and this video lecture or this lecture is a kind of continuation of what we have left in the previous classes or previous sessions so watch out our previous sessions on uh, youtube channel uh, the video is available there but yeah this session is on post modern which is very trending at the same time which is very obscure and full of op open endedness so post modernism or post structuralism these terms are actually very uh, open ended kind of and it has plethora of meaning and it can be applied in different context you can use it in in your research paper you can use it on um, in uh, many of the articles that you want to publish so this is a kind of trending topic which is uh, which you can apply um, almost to in all the genre. Um, uh, having said that, uh, the speaker of today's uh, session is Priya Sharma. She is a uh, uh, research scholar at PHU and she has also qualified NET thrice uh, and this time hopefully she will qualify GRF. Uh, she has scored a good mark. Besides, she has also qualified GATE and uh, she is close friend of mine and uh, the last time i have approached her but then she has a very packed schedule that time and that is the reason why she was not available but now she is available and she is ready to take the classes so i have again means uh, get in touch with her and uh, that's how we have came uh, with this uh, with this topic postmodernism and with this lecture session so with that, uh, I would like to ask Priya to please uh, begin his lecture. Okay. Priya, are you there? Just a minute, let me check. So, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Fine. Thanks. So, first of all, thank you so much, Sharuk, for this overwhelming introduction. And then, uh, good morning, one and all, present over here. So, happy Saraswati Puja to you all. And yes, yes. Uh, let's move to our today's topic so the topic of today's session is defining postmodernism from the perspective of various critics so here what i will be doing is i will uh, be talking about postmodernism and how this term has been defined by uh, various critics like uh, julia kristeva or uh, leotard and baudrillard and frederick jameson so in that way i think it will be become more clear to everyone so yes next slide please so here uh, you can see that at uh, as I have put three th these three images. So you know what do we understand by postmodernism can be seen through the, these images also. So you know is there anyone who can uh, tell me about that what this image of postmodern uh, uh, is telling you? Like what what one meaning are you getting from this image of postmodern? Uh, just try yes yes multiplicity okay and yes yes so uh, yes uh, you all are very correct and see um, how we can define postmodernism so before defining postmodernism we should also understand uh, uh, about modernism and pre-modernism so we'll uh, give just a quick look on them uh, you can see that how this image of pre-modern is defined by a dot so you know why this dot is here see what what is written uh, under that dot that because god put it there and that's the way it's always been so you know before enlightenment what happened our existence was basically revolving around religion and everything was interrelated towards spirituality and church and all and that is why you know there was uh, so much you know conservativeness and that is why everything was somehow 
somehow interrelated with the god and when the era of modernism came you know after enlightenment after the advent of philosophers like rene descartes or john locke and then they gave their philosophies then what happened uh, there was gradual development and also um, the uh, like our society was gradually developing towards science and technology so things started changing and what happened in post modernism that you can see that uh, i can say that this is a this is an image which suddenly not giving us any fits meaning rather you can you can feel that there is an absence of meaning there so you know in one way this absence is also giving us a kind of meaning and that is the essence of postmodernism that is the whole essence of postmodernism like what derrida has said that we can also get meaning from the absence you know so there is also importance of the that absence and that is the whole essence of postmodernism and at the same time it celebrates the intermingling things it it is you can say that it is an inclusive term which incorporate everything in itself you know it is just it just not only talks about only one fixed reality so you can you can feel here the multiple realities you know so in that way i think uh, i am making sense and uh, yes, okay yes. okay okay so after that uh, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, see that there are some factual reality uh, fa factual things which you can find very easily in wikipedia like the term postmodernism was coined by arnold tony b he was a historian and you know this term was uh, used then later by variously by philosophers and literary critics to explain philosophy history art and literature with reference to modernism so basically you know postmodernism was a term or you can say it was a mode of discourse which came after modernism as the term itself suggests that post modernism so you know post means after and modernism defines one movement so something which came after modernism and why it came because it must have been uh, so, uh, some contradiction with the ideologies of modern modern uh, period modernism this movement related to modernism and that is why there was advent of post modernism so you know uh, you can in other words it can be defined like post modernism can be seen as an attitude of skepticism you know towards the notion of grand narratives as well as uh, some kind of fixed meaning like stability of meaning towards the notion of binary opposition stable hierarchy uh, you know like uh, the earlier it was considered uh like the meaning of things which we were getting in terms of binary opposition like black white day night so in that way you know black was always considered something which is related to evil monstrous inferior white was considered as pure you know uh, superior so in that way post modernism the advent of post modernism was Uh, that it altered the whole gamut of you know the whole idea of binary opposition it altered the notion of these kind of fixed meanings so the philosophers or post modernists like i have hasan says that post modernism is a celebration of silence and otherness that was always present though always repressed so in that way you know it started including those whose voice was mar marginalized earlier whose voice were suppressed like you can see the text of uh, franz fanon his uh, very popular text black skin and white mask in that text what does he try to uh, what does actually he was highlighting in that text he was um, like he has presented the narration in the manner of i you know so i what does this i symbolizes this i talks about subjectivity this i talks about his identity not only his identity rather the collective identity about that community from which he was belonging which he was coming and how that identity was dehumanized you know because uh, in that chapter of uh, the essence of blackness or something there is fourth chapter something related related to blackness in which he has very you know uh, very concretely portrayed that how one white girl uh when she watched him she started jumping and she was afraid of watching him and he, she started uh saying to her mother that uh, i am getting afraid that black person is coming so you can see that how human dehumanizing attitude was this but there was not fault of that child 
there was a fault of society which which had inculcated these sorts of meaning inside her so this was the thing which post modernism was actually try, trying to debunk okay so next slide please so before getting uh, into more depth regarding post modernism i think we should uh, know something regarding modernism too so what was actually modernism so modernism was uh, basically basically it is considered as a period uh, which is generally regarded uh, in the first half of the 20th century like from 1900 to 1950s was considered generally as the period or era of modernism so you know modernism was not something which is uh, you know uh, taken as granted no because modernism in itself was a radical movement because it also was a kind of revolution in arts where traditional methods of representing reality were suddenly challenged you know because there were many things were going at a time uh, during uh, this period like you can see that there were various wars like boer war or uh, first world war and at the same time economic depression was going on and at the same time there were advent of various philosophers which changed the whole gamut of this you know discourse uh, what we call disc discourse or epistemic knowledge what we considered so when nietzsche came and he says god is dead so what does he uh, mean by this statement like what did he mean that this statement god is dead anyone what does he wanted to say with this statement does uh, like did he want to say that god who is uh, considered in heaven has died does that mean this okay so uh, so let me make it more clear actually when nietzsche says that god is dead he doesn't mean that god in a literal sense has died actually he wanted to say that our conscience the the yes 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 so yes you are very true correct okay so in that way uh, what happened that he was trying to say that our conscience modern conscience was actually dead and in what sense see earlier there was belief you must have been uh, come across this poem by robert browning the uh, bible and ezra where he what does what does he say he says that grow along with grow along with me the best is yet to be so what was that best which has yet not uh, came so this best was actually considered as after life you know because there was earlier there was notion of after life and this old age was considered as an prepare as a preparation for that after life so people used to believe that if we do good deeds in this age so we'll get heaven and will uh, you know treated well in our after life so that was the notion but you know what with the advent of this industrialization with the advent of science and technology these kinds of beliefs were gradually started diminishing and then people started thinking that okay so we have just live uh, in this one life so why don't we uh, live it uh, fully and this uh, this uh, you know this uh, essence of living was altered in a way that people started uh, shifting their earlier beliefs with the with the notions of greed and they started like living living became the simultaneous of holding wealth and other materialistic thinking and that is why nietzsche says that you, there is no one now there is no one now to support you and that is why you have to sail your boat by own and that is why he is saying that god is dead okay so this was the very essence of this statement which was at that time uh, uh, misunderstood but now it has been more clear and after that you can see in the modern period in the field of art literature um, various changes were going on and why this was going on because the advent of philosophers like charles darwin who altered the whole notion of human existence who started talking about that humans are descendants of apes and he he altered the notion of the great chain of being propounded by thomas aquinas and then uh, philosophers or people like ferdinand sachar who came and talked about the relationship of language and its meaning and then uh, this freud sigmund freud came 
and he he just interrelated our consciousness with unconsciousness he started relocating human psyche within the dreams so you know the person karl marx came who started talking about how our consciousness is determined by our social condition so everything was you know altered like earlier those philosophies which were given were somehow alter started altering by these uh, philosophers and in that way um, its influence were certainly uh, we can see in the art literature also and so we can see that how the literature of this period uh, basically novels were very complex sort of uh, they have very complex narrative techniques like earlier if you will read the victorian novels you will feel that they are uh, though they they you know they give us difficulty in that sense that uh, they are very thick you know and sometimes we get bored mm, like there are so lengthy i mean so many pages but their narrative technique is very clear there it is very linear we we can easily understand that who is the protagonist who is talking to him about what the things have been uh, talked about so in that way they are very clear but in modern age if you will come across the novels like you know uh, Mrs. Dalloway, or or James Joyce, uh, a portrait of artist as a young man, or D. H. Lawrence works. So they are very uh, complex, uh, and uh, you know it challenges the reader while finding meaning. So in that way, what happened? Uh, modernism has had has uh, actually was considered a radical shift from the earlier. Uh, age but what happened why this modernism uh, like why we need the post modernism so there was also one thing what happened that when the focus was uh, like the writer started focusing upon the stream of consciousness in the poems like the wasteland uh, we find that use of myths and allusions fragmentation so there were so many things and at the same time these things become the recurrent you know these things become recurrent like writer of that age try to write in that way so you know it again created a sort of hierarchy It, it it again created a sort of confined structure which needs to be break broke down you know and that is why post modernism came and what happened that in post modernism after the world war second there was an acute crisis of conscience and why this crisis was there was a reason behind it because you know um, people were engaged continuously in wars and earlier these wars were glorified as some kind of you know heroic acts and if you will come across poems of rupert brooke and you will find that how he has glorified the war and it was obvious because at that time you know he has not faced that reality he was in the starting period of the war and that is why he was thanking god that he has uh, given uh, that the god has given him opportunity to fight the war to do something for for his nation but what happened later this delayed sort of war this continuously going uh, uh, war was creating a lot of destruction taking lives and livelihood of the people people started understanding the fact that this ironical uh, i can say that this ironical fact that war was not leading them towards peace because see how ironical this was people were fighting war for establishing peace how can war establish peace the war whose inherent nature itself is violence how can it establish peace so in that way you can find that how world war second basically disillusioned people and they started you know debunks the whole notion which was uh, highlighted earlier and that is why post modernism encompasses the unusual reversal of values forms styles and the, in the whole gamut of art literature architecture music and society there was loss of unity you know fragmentation was celebrated at that time a tireless questioning on traditional cohesive unified ways of thinking there was refusal towards objective reality and what this objective reality was objective reality means a fixed kind of truth a fixed kind of reality for example uh, how can it be possible how can one truth is possible this was the question of post modern for example uh, let's assume a glass of water which is half filled so for me it can be half filled but for you it can be half empty so in that way we both are true so for for uh, for example again you can take a very cliche example of an elephant uh, for example i am standing at the front side of that very elephant then what i can uh, what i will be seeing 
I'll be seeing its trunk. I'll be seeing his eyes. Maybe it's uh, his front legs. And the person who is standing behind the elephant, what he will be seeing? He will be seeing the back legs. He will be seeing the tail. So in that way, what does it mean that I am right and he's wrong or she's wrong? No, because it just it's just all about perspectives. You know, it it is all about perspective. It is all about stand standpoint of view from where we are standing and and from there what we are looking. So in that way, there can't be any one reality. Truth has multifarious angles. Truth can that nothing is absolute true. Nothing is absolutely false. Even the change is also not constant because uh, if the change had been constant, then we will be satisfied. We would have been satisfied with the modern age itself. But then why there was need of postmodernism? So it clearly portrays that even the change is not constant. Okay, so this was the whole notion of postmodernism. Postmodernism was not a fixed sort of, like it, it wasn't creating a fixed sort of notion. It was creating a plastic identity. It was, it was creating a kind of mutable identity, mutable in the sense that it was creating an identity, uh, an identity which was not fixed. You know, it was creating an identity which was in the process of becoming, which was keep on changing. So this was the whole idea. Uh, next slide, please. See, I just want to say that I uh, don't have any expertise in the field of art. But uh, uh, just for the understanding purpose, I have taken these images. So here we can see that what is the difference between modern art and postmodern art. So you can find that, uh, see, in this image, like white on white, this uh, person, this uh, here is a, he's a painter, Kazmir Melvich. So he tried to imagine that how can we portray white on white? And for this, he has, uh, you know, he has created this white uh, square upon the white wall. And in that way, we can find, you know, a, a, uh, like an individual meaning from it, we can getting a concrete meaning from this very painting. Again, in this painting of modern art, where is a person holding an umbrella and walking on this watery road. So we can find just one meaning, like we can getting the essence of that painting, we can say that what this painting is trying to portray. But let's look at this painting of postmodern art. So you uh, are you able to find just one meaning from it? Is there anyone who is able to find just one meaning from it? No, so, yes. So, yes, someone is saying sexual activity. Okay. Okay. So, see, if there is sex only sexual activity is going on, then what about uh, these people who are listening to music? Or what about these people who are standing behind and uh, looking at something? So, you know, there are various things going on at a time. And that is why postmodern is unique in its way because it provides you multiple things. You know, it is it provides you multiple things and it is up to you, like as per your knowledge, what meaning are you able to find out from that very uh, painting. Okay, so this was the whole essence of postmodern art. It doesn't provide you any concrete sense of reality. It doesn't provide you any uh, possible depth. You know, it it is uh, it is totally upon you that what are you able to grasp from that very figure. So this was postmodern. It it creates you know it includes subjectivity. It doesn't contain any one objective reality. So uh, this was my purpose to uh, showcase this uh, painting in front of you. And so next slide, please. Yes, obviously, we can say flexible. But again, see, words have a different connotation. When you are saying that uh, postmodernism is flexible, then what do you mean by flexible? OK, so uh, we will discuss it later. First, I think I should uh, finish the slides first. So yes, from here we'll start uh, from the our first critic, Joe Franco Leotard. 
so he was french philosopher and you know he was director of the international school of philosophy uh, and then his two works the postmodern condition a report on knowledge and answering the question what is postmodernism became very popular and you know why it became very popular it became very popular at that time because he was talking about things which was not even existing at that time and now a days we can find its relevance like what leotard was saying is quite relevant in the contemporary world and that is why this person became so popular his works became uh, you know his his works were um, translated in various languages so according to him what postmodernism was so postmodernism is incredulity towards meta narrative so i have uh, already discussed about meta narrative or grand narratives that these are universal kind of notions like some narratives which are taken as universal uh, like uh, you know a kind of fixed meaning has been accepted so he was saying that post modernism is suspicious towards those fixed meanings rather it celebrates mini narratives it takes a small story like it takes some stories we celebrate small places their history their cultures uh, it celebrates local events and that is why post modernism includes mini narratives not meta narrative like it doesn't say that okay prospero in the tempest was superior and caliban was inferior it is not the case it it doesn't say like this rather it debunks this notion of superior and inferior and he says that a work can be a work can become modern only if it is first post modern see how beautifully he describe he is describing post modernism he says that a work can become modern only if it is first post modern so what are you getting from this definition he is saying that consider post modernism as a pupa and modernism as a butterfly so you will itself imagine that who who will come first obviously the pupa will be coming first and why he is saying saying this he is saying this because you know modern uh, age was something which is related to fixed identity organized structure and cohesive shape you know but post modernism as i have already discussed that it was considered as something which is very plastic which is mutable there was no sort of fixed idea because uh, see if there would have been any fixed idea then every philosophers would have talked about the same thing about post modernism but you know leotard is saying something else baudrillard is saying something else julia kristeva is saying something else so in that way you can see the very term post modern post modern has been defined by various philosophers in various ways so how it can be uh, you know a fixed notion it is not a fixed notion and that is what leotard is talking about that a work can become only modern if it is first post modern because it doesn't have any fixed shape so this was the whole essence of his definition and after that uh, about post modernism he has talked various other things like he says that uh, post modernism was the transition from the industrial age to information age so how it was tra transition from industrial age to information age because he says that politics of space is not now necessary rather than we are moving towards politics of speed so what do you mean by this politics of speed and information so you know what he was basically saying uh, consider the example of mobile okay so uh, see if i don't have mobile phone cell phone and you have this cell phone then uh, certainly you are more powerful uh, you are at the more powerful position than me and why because you are grasping the whole sort of information in your hand which i don't have so this was his saying that modern age is uh, like post modern age is not uh, leading by words and weapons rather than it is leading by informations and that is why you know the cyber crimes has been increased you this pegasus uh, you know this uh, pegasus is in its um, is like quite highlighted kind of controversy in india or sometimes you must uh, have been heard that uh, as it is speculated that russia has hacked the elections of america then why because of information so you can understand that how knowledge has become important how information has become important in this age so this was according to uh, leotard and also he has provided certain terms like language game different and dissensus so in language game he was trying to say that 
basically it was a term coined by ludwig wittgenstein and he was saying that language game is system of rules and conventions which frame and govern a particular discourse so what do you mean by this basically uh, consider an example of chess so in chess we can feel that there are pre established rules and according to which we play but at the same time we have to apply our own creative creativity to win or uh, to win that game you know so in that way he was saying that language game is basically a minimum criteria to exist in the society because language games means a person comes across various language games at a time like we we are something else in our home we are something else in schools we are something else before our friend we are something else before the society so we are the part of various language games at a time and this this language games are uh, important in the sense of producing meaning so we create meaning through in our society through this language game we become the part of various activities at the same time and further he talks about different where he says that we don't have any fixed sort of uh, notion for judging truth or we don't have any common measure to find uh, any idea or or judging any truth and that is why we are living in this fragmented world and because we are living in this fragmented world and that is why mini narratives are important because in that way they, we can we all can you know keep truth before the world like we can all keep we can all present our own reality before the world so this was the whole idea so next slide please <clears throat> Yes. After that, Joe Baudrillard uh, came, and he was a French sociologist, philosopher, cultural theorist, and photographer. So basically, uh, Baudrillard worked in the field of media studies, and he has uh, coined two very popular terms like hyperreality and other was simulacra or simulacrum. You can say it means image or imitation. So according to him, postmodern age is a culture of simulacrum. And why he was saying this? because uh, he has uh, you can understand this uh, thing by the given image see this image is taken from don delilo don delilo's work he's he is an american writer who has written a novel called the white noise so in this white noise we can what we can find that how people are running behind the image see they are standing before uh, like they are standing in front of a mountain and you can see that how everybody is clicking the picture of that very mountain or clicking the picture of uh, that uh, whatever the scenario is presented over there but nobody is interested in watching the beauty of that very scene which is uh, in front of their eyes so this is the case of the modern world you know we are believing more in images rather than reality or in when we go to visit taj mahal or things like that so in that case you know sometimes we go there to just confirm it that what we have seen in the images either true or not or what happens then when you will see the taj mahal in reality you will feel that it is not that beautiful uh, as you have seen it in the images and why this happens because media present the reality in a way you know it present reality in its ideal form it it makes the image more beautiful than the reality itself and that is why it happens or a, a very general example you can take like we do online shopping so in online shopping what do we see uh, in uh, in online shopping what do we actually do do we uh, do we uh, buy the real object or do we buy the images what do we do actually we buy we see uh, like we confirm our product through those images we are not seeing the actual uh, product we are not touching it but still uh, from that very image we confirm that okay we have to take this uh, product so this was his uh, you know this was his uh, main uh, sort of claiming that how post modern world is losing the reality it has become artificial and how in this post modern world all sort of values meanings originality or authenticity everything is losing you know everything is losing its ground and he says that post modern world has lost its capacity to distinguish between what is artificial and what is real so there is no original so this was his main claim and you can understand it through his example of disneyland when he says that disneyland so does disneyland really exist 
no it doesn't is exist it is a man made kind of uh, thing for their own entertainment but nowadays you know if we talk about disneyland we talk uh, it in a way that it really exist so this was uh, the thing which he wanted to claim and he says that see he says that there is no original quote there is no original post modernism has lost the capacity to distinguish between artificial and real so this was hyper reality means presentation of something in a way that it looks like more real than the reality itself so this was baudrillard uh, like his main notion and if you want to study uh, hyper reality in depth then uh, you should consult with the book by slavoj zizak in which he that book where he says welcome to the desert of the real this is the name of the book where he talks about how the post modern world is losing its main substance so you can go through this book if you like and yes please next slide Okay, so Frederick Jameson. See, Frederick Jameson has talked about many things, like in his work "Postmodern or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism." He has talked about postmodernism, uh, and he defined it in relation with capitalism. But actually, the I will be talking here about the main ideas. Basically, he was saying that basically he was critiquing this notion of periodizing the term, like we say, like I have already said that uh, postmodernism can be defined after, uh, you know, this it was considered. as the second half of the 20th century so he was critiquing this notion of uh, confining this con uh, you know this periodizing this term post modernism uh, in a fixed date so this was the uh, his main argument and further uh, related to post modernism he has given this term pastiche which is the imitation of one style by another but it does not contain irony or satire like parody there is uh, you know there is difference between pastiche and parody parody is something which is making fun of one thing um, uh, or it is presented in a sort of humorous way dehumanizing way but pastiche is something you can say it is an imitation of things like here you can find mona lisa uh, and her you know pastiche of her image so here it is not making fun rather people created uh, these sort of image for their own purpose for their business purpose or for gaining uh, you know money in that in that sense but in literature how will you look upon this pastiche so in literature what happens consider the example of like um, rosencrantz and guildenstern are dead so in that uh, play by tom stupert what do you find you find that this play is not meant for making fun of the original play hamlet rather it is celebrating that play rather it is uh, celebrating the minor characters of the that very play you know the rosen and crans and guildenstern are given a very little space and that original book of um, of shakespeare but you know here tom stupert is talking about these two marginalized characters so in a way you can also say that how post modern gives voice to those whose voice has been suppressed so this was the logic behind it and also frederick jameson uh, regarding post modernism has talked about like how post modernism was not confined in a fixed period rather than it is related to our social Uh, you know socio economic condition this was the thing that he has represented all these things by giving examples of various painters like van gogh and andy warhol diamond dust shoes so um, there are various things about frederick jameson talks about but basically what we can understand mainly uh, in this stage is this pastiche and parody okay so yes next please so yulia kristeva so again yulia kristeva is bulgarian french uh, psychoanalyst uh, feminist and she has talked about uh, semiotic and symbolic symbolic these terms are very famous i think you must be familiar with all those terms and she also talks about this idea of intertextuality and she says that what the, what we mean by intertextuality so basically intertextuality is interacting interaction of one text with the other text like how one text is shaping its meaning from the other text so this was the whole uh, essence of intertextuality and why it is necessary because uh, for example if you will read the text of derrida where he talks about sign structure and play so there in the very beginning he quoted montal and he says that uh, montal says that we should interpret the interpretation rather than 
to interpret things so you know he has started his debate from uh, this very court of uh, this very people and then he talks about what nietzsche has is, uh, has said what martin heidegger has said and what claude levi strauss has said and in that way we can see that how he is developing his own ideas so basically derrida says that when levi strauss talks about that art is superior like artist is superior and critics comes later so regarding this ideology derrida says that no it can't be the case because nothing is original here everyone takes inspiration from someone else to develop their own ideology and that is what intertextuality is like shaping our own ideas from getting influenced from other works or people or person you know so this is intertextuality and uh, you can see the intertextuality in the wasteland very clearly like how cleverly t s uh, eliot has uh, taken uh, the terms from various texts and produced his own ideology produced his own poem you know or you can see the text of uh, that person vladimir nabokov this lolita and see the first line of that uh, that very novel and then just read the first line of nagamandala by girish karnad and you will understand what intertextuality is i am not going to tell you what was exactly the lines were but just read it by yourself the one line the very beginning line of lolita and the beginning line of the play nagamandala by girish karnad and you will find that how ideas shapes uh, like takes its shape in in an author in a playwright and how they take inspiration like how one text takes inspiration from the other text so this was intertextuality and it is very necessary to relate interrelationships between you know one thing with the other and that is why julia kristeva says that intertextuality is the shaping of the text by another text and rola bar says the same thing in just in different words like text is a tissue of quotation it is a fluid it is a fluid it means that it is not fixed its meaning keeps on changing and it it can take its ideas from other text okay so in that way intertextuality has been defined by julia, julia kristeva and also i wanted to say something which i forgot regarding intertextuality okay we'll discuss uh, it later sometimes and yes next slide okay so um, regarding all these things in conclusion we can say that what patricia was says that skepticism like the attitude of doubt suspicion or paranoia are the tools of postmodernism so in a nutshell we can say that it attacks the idea of stability and the possibility of grounding our knowledge in certainty and truth like uh, she is saying that we can't just assume that there is one certain truth one fixed meaning okay it celebrates fragmentation and claims to liberate creativity from the predetermined central discourse of society so postmodernism is basically celebrating fragmentation it is the ideas like it is un- inculcating ideas from different societies different perspectives so in that way it is celebrating the whole lot of society be it uh, of black society like african world or be it american world be it british world or indian world it glorifies all so this was the essence of postmodernism uh, thank you so much i hope uh, i make some sense like you are getting what i have what i wanted to say so yes is there any question you want to ask or is there uh, any, any observation, observation or is there anything you want to say like so participant can ask or they, they can also post their questions if, if they would like to do so basically a uh, text within a text no what uh, sorry please repeat again variety the text within a text yes you can say but you know um, uh, intertextuality is text within the text but you know in that way uh, it's not like a kind of plagiarism it is not a plagiarism rather 
you can say that the author takes the ideas from one text you know and sometimes uh, it is deliberate or sometime it is unconsciously like because they have been uh, born and brought up in that society so they take ideas from that uh, very author so in that way yes we can say that intertextuality uh, we can find that yes one text is interacting with the other text in a way but text within see text within text or story within story is like story within story so one story there are two stories in a text in that way but text within a text again uh, you can say text within a text means that a writer is uh, like an author is writing something and the character is again uh, propounding some ideas so in that way are you trying to saying text within a text I like take certain ideas of yes uh, the author takes uh, actually your vi voice is not audible very clearly but yes uh, i can say that what you are saying i'm getting your points yes the author takes ideas or sometimes they take uh, complete like one statement from one author so in that way we can say that it interacts with one text with the other text see simulacra and simulacra means image imitation and image this way like you know our society has become like our contemporary society has become uh, like a simulacrum so contemporary society has become like a sim simulacrum it means that uh, simulacra is basically image and simulacrum is the imitation of that image so in that way just uh, i have explained it like i have told you now like how do we do online shopping so we do online shopping just by the help of images there is no fixed reality there there is no uh, like the uh, the product is itself not present there we just take the help of image and we confirm that okay we have to buy this product so in that way one image and uh, the copy of image is just propagating through uh, by media and uh, like it is very difficult to bifurcate between what is real and what is artificial this was yes ma'am this was beautiful explanation actually i had a question ma'am if if i can ask okay sure yeah if so i would be able post, to answer it yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how you know po postmodern theory is related to poststructuralism? See, postmodern is an umbrella term, and poststructuralism and deconstru deconstruction are basically associated with it, because you know postmodern. Uh, is an interdisciplinary term it was not only in the field of uh, literature or art rather it was in the field of in, uh, architecture in the field of uh, you know philosophy so postmodernism is an umbrella term but post structuralism or deconstruction as you can find you can see those terms or you can notice those terms in a way of textual interpretation you know in how we interpret our like how earlier we were interpreting our text and how now we are interpreting our text so these terms were mostly uh, uh, you know prevalent in textual interpretation or interpretation of text how uh, earlier structuralism came into being and then how that notion of stru structuralism was later debunked by uh these post structuralist so these terms always intermingle with uh, with each other you know so this was the case post modernism is uh, uh you know is an umbrella term is a more it's is a bigger term you know and post structuralism is basically related to interpretation of text and textual analysis oh, thank you thank you thank you so much and uh, also you know these people might be believing that uh, that us uh, another signified to signify yes yes meaning uh, is postponed meaning is deferred uh -huh. yes so that is also post in post modernism no that is uh -huh. what uh, in post modernism can we see a fixed meaning no we can't see a fixed meaning so But, uh, this is so in that way meaning you can imagine meaning according to yourself 
not yourself like according as per your knowledge as per your culture as per your society you would be able to uh, like interpret the meaning of that very text so post modernism was also saying this but in post structuralism was saying this in terms of textual uh, analysis thank you so much thank you Yeah, so Mr. Prashant has posted a question. Can we say postmodernism is more subjective based on the freedom to everyone and it was also more scientific, less spiritual, more rotten, more crude? I think uh, I think uh, the person who has asked the question has already given the answer, I think. Because, uh, you know, Mr. Prashant has already explained uh, that why we can say postmodernism is more subjective. He has given all those interpretations. So, yes, that was the case. So, yes, uh, now I want to say that uh, if you people would like to continue these lectures and uh, if you want that i conduct some classes so if you want to give some topics from your side so you can post your topics uh, in telegram group so that we will conduct it in further sessions there is one more question yeah yeah, yeah sure sure posted by ajay kumar verma uh, he is asking that postmodernism is opposite of deconstruction because what I find that deconstruction slows down our reading and we, and we become stuck for finding the meaning whereas in postmodernism life is very fast and we try to find everything in a hurry way. So, See again it depends upon like it is a very subjective notion and uh, what Ajay Kumar Verma is saying you know postmodernism and deconstruction was not actually separated from each other it is like they complete each, each other and postmodernism uh, as I said is an umbrella term and deconstruction was its part and it doesn't basically slow down like it depends upon person to person and their perspective I am not uh, like uh, criticizing or altering his ideas but as per what we have studied like I have studied uh, deconstruction is not uh, basically slows down our reading rather than it gives us a kind of liberty to find out as uh, many meanings uh, like we can find out or interpret from a text so it gives us a kind of liberty to find out uh, meanings from our own perspective so this was the case and further like i have to look upon this if uh, what he's saying it may be the case but i but as per now i i don't agree very much with that yeah i mean deconstruction is a kind of tool that actually equips us yes. to deconstruct a text so Rather than uh, the opposite of postmodernism, post it's kind of continuation of that. But then Derrida always denied that he does not belong to the post-structuralist school. So uh, uh, means uh, and uh, and neither he said that uh, I I am coining a term like deconstruction. But then uh, critics attributed this term to him that he is the pro main proponent of and deconstructionist. And yes, at the same time, it gives you all sort of liberty. Now, there's no fixed meaning that you have to uh, just decode this text in just this way. Like you have to decode this text from the perspective of white people. You have to decode this text from the perspective of black people or African people. This is not the case now. Like you can interpret the text according to your own ideology. Just for example, you can see the text by the A Tempest. Sorry, it is A Tempest by Aim Cesaire. So in that text, he has talked differently. Like he has talked, uh, uh, he has talked about the story of Caliban, Ariel, or and Prospero in a very different uh, perspective. So why this? Uh, why why this happened? Because of that sort of liberty uh, he took. 
from that very text and he now he was able to interpret th that text earlier there was a kind of notion which i told that uh, binary opposition that white is considered this and black is considered this and that is why we ourselves assumed that thing but when chinu achi became and say said that until the uh, until the lion don't tell its history the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter so what does it mean that until the victims will not come uh, forward and will tell their own story their story will be keep on molding by uh, by the perspectives of uh, their uh, like uh, under court their superiors so in that way i think deconstruction works yeah thank you so much priya um uh, your session was really interactive at the same time we have gained a plethora of uh, new insights from this lecture and you you have covered almost all sort of uh, important critics and the philosophers of their time and also their key ideas and uh, there are a few candidates who are also appearing in gate so that this might help them uh, in their gate examination also but then i will just try to repeat whatever uh priya has all already told told means uh, mm. yeah sorry can you hear me yes now yeah yeah, yeah yeah so uh, priya has uh, talked about uh, this uh, different and then uh, she talked about uh, meta fiction uh, and the intertextuality late capitalism so these are actually the important terms when it comes to postmodernism and you must know these terms these are very important uh, this has been frequently asked in ugc net and i'm pretty sure that they will ask it in gate also so with that thank you so much priya for your uh, insightful lecture and all the participants who have joined us today we will be oh, conducting more sessions in oh, the your patience listening yeah 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 so we will be conducting more sessions uh, because of this gate examination we have postponed it 